I was trying to think of what to do in sort of just a few minutes, but to try to give a little bit of character to uh, what, what I think is different about UNITE um, in terms of uh, any other union in New Zealand and uh, most and often, uh, you know, around the world a little bit different. We, we started with nothing. So we, we started with a hundred members who, who, who were sort of, it was a boutique union for people who didn't fit. And uh, we turned it into a union with 7,000 financial members. We did it uh, uh, with, you know, over a million dollars a year in income with 20 staff. And, uh, and it was a roller coaster ride from, from the beginning through to the end. We've only just uh, this year got out of debt. Um, we only just this year finished paying off the tax man, you know. Uh, well, actually last year and, uh, and some of our other debts. And, uh, and uh, because, you know, we were, uh, you know, you had to, you had to, yeah, when, you, when, you, when you start with nothing, then you go into debt and you build up debt and you, but you do it because you're confident that the course you're on is going to deliver. And the course, we, I think of the way to sum it up is actually that it was a, a that we, we established UNITE as a class struggle union. That is, it wasn't a, a union that was going to be a sort of a, just representing any particular group of workers. It was going to be a union that could represent almost any worker at all. And we approached the fights that we were going to undertake from the point of view of the class, what the class needed, not, not what the organisation needed, not what the bureaucracy needed or the officialdom needed, but looking at what the class needed. And the class, in the first instance, needed to be reorganised. That, uh, that unionism had been reduced from 40% in the, in the private sector to 8% in the private sector, or 10% around, it's gone down, continued to go down even after we started organising. But, you know, from to, to less than 10% of the workforce in the private sector. And so vast sectors of the, of the workforce, including the industrial workforce, and in particular, the modern industrial workforce and fast food and casinos and call centres and, and so on, were uh, completely ignored. Uh, by the unions which had gone through a terrible period of retreat, but retreated only to the high ground, to the full-time permanent workforces uh, where they could um, uh, lead a protected uh, existence. Uh, we were choosing the most difficult ground to start on, but we, but we, we began with a confidence and faith that the, that the, that the mantra that, we had, that had been being preached was not true that young workers would join unions, that when it was explained that collective organisation was possible, uh, then, that, uh, then they would respond accordingly. And so we launched our campaigns with this in mind. So it was a campaign to reorganise fast food. Uh, it was a sector-wide, an industry-wide campaign. Even, not even just one particular union or one particular company uh, did we try and start with and knock that over and move on to the next. No, we adopted a whole industry-wide approach um, almost from day one. Um, 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 we, 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 we approached it from the point of view of winning allies across the, the class, and not uh, across the, uh, uh, the, uh, all workers, uh, all young people, uh, uh, who are interested in progressive change. And, uh, and we moved on with campaigns from that, organising industrially in the fast food industry, to major campaigns around, around and there's sort of essentially four main sort of class-wide themes, I think, if you like. One was a major boost to the minimum wage and the abolition of youth rates. So, uh, and both of those were achieved, at least partially. Well, abolition of youth rates, certainly, and, and we lifted the minimum wage from from uh, around 36 or 37 percent of the average wage to just over 50 percent of the average wage, and we're, but in the process of doing that, this was a this was a political campaign that the unions, this little union, was running that that involved collecting 200,000 signatures on a petition campaign that was outside every sporting event, every community event, every every cultural event in the country over a two-year period, um, and the, and the government responded and moved. Uh, uh, to, to, to shift the minimum wage significantly in real terms. Um, um, we, have, we have campaigned repeatedly around uh, 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 the uh, precarious nature of employment for the modern working class. 
and how to challenge that. And that's where we moved, uh, uh, after moving the minimum wage, after getting youth rates to the need to challenge this, what's dubbed that precarity, the precariousness, the zero hour contract regime that operates in so many industries we discovered actually was extraordinarily widespread. Uh, among private sector workers. The Restaurant Association of New Zealand had a standard contract for all, its, uh, all, the, all the affiliates of the Restaurant Association of New Zealand which said you will be available to work seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. You will work when, when required. That was what, that's, the, that, that's how far things had gone back in terms of standard employment agreements and that an industry body could think that this was a, a normal, uh, normal behaviour, and that's why I think we were so, so almost, you know, almost, um, almost magically successful with the campaign. Or rather, it was just uh, it took off because it was the reality, the lived reality for hundreds of thousands of workers and their families, and family members knew it and wanted to fight back and wanted to respond, wanted to support us in any way uh, that that they could. Um, 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 we, we, we took on an issue that's actually going to result in billions of dollars being paid back to the workers in New Zealand, which was that, again, it was because no other union took it up, no other union fought it seriously, which was that they were underpaying workers who, are, who, who, who worked irregular hours, you know, irregular hours from week to week, they were underpaying people or not doing a check on their, on their annual leave entitlement. Simple thing, the law says you should do a check. It's the higher of the last four weeks or, the pre or your average, right? But no one was doing the higher of. We discovered that this was not happening and, 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 and one of our things, and we moved that on to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the fast food companies and demanded that they comply. We tried to talk to the broader union movement around it, but they weren't interested. Oh, I know this, because full-time doesn't affect full-time salary. doesn't affect full-time workers. It doesn't affect salaried workers because uh, there's no difference between, the, you don't have to do that calculation. It only affects 90% uh, you know, of our members, but, um, um, uh, and in the end, the Ministry of Business admitted that, uh, that nearly every employer in the country was not compliant with the law in this regard. That every employer that has a large number of part-time workers with irregular hours was not compliant and, uh, and, that, and we're now in the process of, of legally and otherwise, and the Ministry, the, the government agency is involved in investigating and, and enforcing compliance because they couldn't do what they wanted to do, which uh, they initially discussed, the Ministry initially proposed that they simply legalise it, but they, the government was too scared to you know, legalise the practice, but the government was wise enough not to do that. So the government said that the, that the Ministry has to enforce the law in this regard, and so every significant employer is going is doing calculations for covering yeah, covering probably two million workers in the country, uh, you know, or a million or more workers at least who are on these more irregular hours uh, uh, have to recalculate their annual leave uh, entitlement. Um, we're fought against the, the welfare bashing, the the, tri the attempts to deny working people access to proper benefits, and so on. And most recently, we've uh, taken up a fight around the issue of, uh, of migrants, migrant workers. And, 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 and what we discovered was that um, there actually exists in the, in the, uh, a large, precarious, again, precarious layer of the working class in the country that is being largely ignored. Um, so there's actually something at any one time there is at least 150,000 workers on temporary visas in New Zealand, right? And that's a, that's a significant, that's, I don't know, 10% of the, of the workforce, you know, uh, nearly, um, uh, of the workforce. Industries we are in, including the fast food companies we represent, told us that, for instance, in restaurant brands, the KFC Pizza Company, 40% of their staff were on temporary visas, right? Um, now these might be uh, students who are who are, who are in this in the uh, you know who are being extorted by a, by a, by an awful sort of export education industry taking advantage of them, um, 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 but they and they're working part time as students, and often though in the hope of getting promoted to a manager's position, and of course, and then hopefully towards a permanent residence. I think so. They use the sort of use the the, the carrot of, of of possibly reaching permanent residence. To, to create a whole industry uh, of uh, a, a private sort of sector industry around around that, 
Uh, so tens of thousands of, of students are in the country uh, doing that and a significant subsidy even to the public tertiary education uh, sector. Um, but there's also many, many workers who are then, uh, whose contracts are tied to the employer as the sponsor. And so they can't even change employer. It's impossible for them to change employer. And investigation after investigation shows that these workers are being horribly mistreated and, uh, and so on. So we've got large, the, the large sectors, the health sector, home care sector with Filipino nurses, the construction sector of, in Christchurch with, with mostly Filipino labour. Uh, for the Christchurch uh, rebuild. So, so significant industrial sectors and the entire tourism and hospitality sector where 30 or 40 percent of the workforce will be um, uh, people on temporary visas, working holiday visas. People who are in vulnerable positions. So, so what, I, what we are trying to do is to say it's not, it's not enough to, to simply say um, a little bit, you know, you can get a little bit of that we're socialists with uh, you know, open immigration and that's it. That's not, that's not a it's not an answer, actually. I, I don't, you know, it's not an answer, right? It's um, uh, what the answers need to be for these workers, right? These workers need equal rights, right? And they need to be equal rights now. Uh, and uh, and there are things that can be done that give them much better rights in the, in the immediate, even if even if they're on temporary visas and so on. Simply the right to change a job, for example, very important demands. One one we should be raising and championing and campaigning on. In fact, the government did in Christchurch because the because the because the workers were being so horribly exploited in the construction industry that it made a special exemption. Uh, to the for not not just Filipinos but mostly for the Filipino workers in the in the construction industry that they could change jobs uh, if they were uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a bad situation. So we've got to we've got to deal with with real issues, real problems, and not deal with them in the abstract. I think it's an important thing, but deal with but but and we need a labour movement that has a class struggle, class wide perspective, and is willing to take up the fight for the interests of working people as a whole, including those who are the most oppressed and discriminated on within that class, but with real solutions, not abstract ones. Go on.